receive our worship today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We love you, God.
Hallelujah. The Lord's presence is very much in this room right now. We're going to take our needs before the Lord. And before we do that, I'd like to read a scripture from Matthew chapter 21 to you. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer believing, ye shall receive. So that means we can take any need that we have before him today. No matter what that need is, it can be a mountain and we can ask it to be removed and it shall be removed. That's what the promise that Jesus said here is. That's what he told us. If we believe, it shall be done. Amen. Yes, amen. We have some needs today that we need to remember as we pray. We need to remember Sister Beulah. She's in the hospital. She needs the Lord to touch her body. We need to remember Heather Gordon who is sick. Anthony Sifford also who is um, still recovering from a stroke. Um, getting good reports on him pretty much every day. Michelle Clark needs prayer for physical and mental strength. Diane Hanners, who fell at the nursing home. Darla Crane, who has um, had a recent uh, brain tumor removal, and she's starting chemo. She needs the Lord to continually touch her body. We need to remember Rick. He's being tested for leukemia. Also, Tony, who's been dealing with cancer. And Sister Ada's sister, Virginia. We need to continually pray for Brother Mark Morris, who's having a heart complication and a heart issue and we need to remember Aubrey who's having pregnancy complications. We also need to remember Chris Helm who's been having heart issues as well and um, we need to remember our community. We need to remember those people that we are surrounded by every day. Those people that we can have influence on and that they would be able to have ears that are willing to hear and a heart that's willing to receive whenever we get that opportunity to give them the truth, to present that to them. Let's take these needs before the Lord. If you have a need that you want to come up and you want to be prayed for by the ministry, you can do that at this time also. Lord, we worship you today, God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house today to worship you. To bring our needs before you, God. To lay them down at your feet, God. We thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you, Lord, that you keep your promises, God. We thank you that we can believe in whatever we ask. If we believe, God, it's going to be done. That's what your word says today, Lord. I pray for every person who's dealing with sickness today, God. That they can be touched in their body. That they can be healed. Lord, I pray for those people who have been sick, God, for a while, that you would just continually touch their body, God, continually heal them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. I praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray for those people in this room today who just need a little bit of hope, God. They just need a little strength and a little peace from you, God, in this place today. Hallelujah. We believe, God, that whatever we ask, it shall be done in your name, Jesus.
lift your hands right now. Whatever that need is that you just confess to him. I want you to thank him for the answer. Hallelujah. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Go ahead and thank you. If you have the faith, you have the substance this morning of what you need to receive from God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. What a beautiful presence of the Lord that's here. And what a fantastic crowd this morning in the house of the Lord on this Sunday morning as we are rapidly adjusting to our new schedule and beginning to get into that routine. I'm thankful for these opportunities that we're all taking advantage of. And I've heard good reports this morning of what went on in your classes. Let's give the Lord thanks for the teaching of His Word and the instruction of our children, the courage of the saints. Amen. Amen. God bless the praise team. Thank you for ministering today. Let's turn in the Word of God to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, and then also Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 17 through 19 is where I'm reading from today. If you're a guest today, we want you to know how thankful we are that you are here. We have several return guests today. We're thankful for the growth that we're seeing in the youth and children's ministry Amen. over the past few weeks. Thank the Lord for what he is doing in all these areas. And I'm here today just to encourage you uh, to believe God for greater things. Amen. Would you look at your neighbor and say, believe God for something greater. Believe God for something greater. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Isaiah 43, verse 19 is where I'll be reading from. Let me quickly make a couple of announcements here. Our Christmas for Christ offering deadline is next Sunday, January the 29th. That's one week from right now. Our goal this year is $5,000. That's a lofty goal, 1300 more than what we gave last year. And if we will give sacrificially together, uh, we will get there and our North American missionaries will receive the support that they need. We're believing for a record offering for our district, Missouri district, of $300,000 this year. Somebody said we're going to do it. We're going to do it. In Jesus' name. This church is going to do our part. Others in our fellowship will do their part. And God will multiply and bless. Immediately following the worship service on Sunday, February the 5th, okay, that's two weeks from today, I will be meeting with all of our current praise team singers and musicians, as well as those who are interested in serving on the praise team in the future. This is our annual meeting, and so if you're wanting to be involved in those ministries, or you are currently involved, if you're currently involved, it's mandatory that you be in that yearly meeting, and uh, also that if you're going to want to join in the future, sometime this year, you want to sing on altar team or praise team, then you need to be in that meeting to learn about the requirements to be involved in that ministry. So don't forget those important things uh, coming up. All right, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Somebody say a new thing. A new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. I want to preach to you this morning on this thought, believing God for a new thing. I want you to say it out loud. I'm believing God, believing God. for a new thing. A new Would you lift your hands to me right now and let's ask the Lord to bless and increase our faith through the ministry of his word this morning. In the name of Jesus, we take dominion and authority over every thought that would hinder the work of God in this room right now. I take dominion over every spirit that would be a hindrance. Yes, and I proclaim, I proclaim victory and liberty to everyone's mind that has been held in bondage. And we're going to believe you today, God, for greater things and for even a new thing today in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost already moving in this room right now. Oh, let's praise this day. Oh, hallelujah. 
Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. As Pentecostal believers, we do not ascribe to the cessationist teachings that other religious movements hold to. And I'm referring to the notion that when the last apostle died, all the miracle signs and wonders that took place in the early church as recorded in the book of Acts ended and that supernatural demonstrations of God's power are no longer available to the church today. In actuality, cessationism is a doctrine of convenience used to justify the traditionalism and spiritual insensitivity that caused the majority of professing Christians over the course of centuries to be less and less apostolic, which is to say that they became less and less like the apostles in doctrine, in experience, and in practice. And as that process played out, someone began to teach at some points, at po point in time, that tongues have already ceased. So now we don't have to feel bad about the fact that nobody speaks in tongues like the apostles in our churches anymore. Are there no miracles taking place? Well, that means either something is wrong with us or maybe, just maybe, it's not that we're failing to exercise faith and stand upon the Word of God like we once did. No, maybe it's just that God doesn't do those things anymore. Come on. And you see, He's given instead knowledge to doctors and entrusted them with all things related to wellness. He just doesn't involve Himself with humanity that way anymore. You see, that's the rationalization and the process of which you go from being like the original to a watered down version where there are no miracles, there are no signs, there are no wonders, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that yes, tongues will cease, and the miracles will cease, and the prophetic will cease to operate simply because no one is believing God for those things anymore. The answer to our lack of spiritual provision is not to pretend that supernatural demonstration of the power of God is no longer available to us and that this is really no big deal anyway because it's just not really necessary anymore. Take a look around you. Look at our world today. Would you say our world is getting better with less of God in it? Is the wisdom of men proving to be an adequate substitute for the power and demonstration of the Spirit? To say that miracle signs and wonders have ceased because God has given us the knowledge in our generation to deal with our problems by ourselves would be one of the most foolish statements that can ever pass through the lips of a person who professes to know the living God. But that kind of thinking is why today only about 60% of Americans self-identify as Christians. That is down from 75% just 10 years ago and 90% 50 years ago. I want you to think on that for a moment. 50 years ago, roughly about the time that I came into this world, 90% of Americans profess to be Christian. I ask you what happened to our nation, and I will tell you what happened. With each passing year, just a little less dependence upon God. Just a little more leaning upon our own understanding. Just a little less acknowledgement of God in our ways. Just a little less direction from God in choosing our paths. And that's how you go from 90% Christian to 60% Christian. And from 60% Christian to 40% Christian. And eventually to total loss of godly beliefs and values. And now let's shine some light on ourselves. When I read that statistic, I wondered what percent Christian I am compared to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 25 years ago. We all know people of whom we could say we remember when they were 90% Christian. Are you following my drift here? That's to say they weren't perfect, but they were trying. They, were, they hadn't arrived, but we could say that's about 90%. Christian, like the apostles, doing everything they could do, believing God for everything that they could imagine. Right. 
striving for perfection. They hadn't reached the full measure of the stature of Christ, but they were getting close. They were 90% of the way there. Not perfect by any means, but very consistent in their walk with God and highly dependent upon the Lord. Their level of desire to please the Lord, a solid 9 out of 10. But with the passage of time, there has been a slow but steady loss of the spiritual and the supernatural in their life. It did not happen all at once or else they would have noticed their lack and they would have realized their lack and their loss. If I could give a very imperfect analogy to the way that the enemy in the world sucks the life out of that person who is Christian in almost every way, following God to the best of their ability, on their way to the full measure of the stature of Christ. If I could, if I could give you a very imperfect analogy, the one that I think will convey the picture, it's kind of like, you know, Dracula. Bram Stoker's Dracula, that vampire, he represents the evil, right? But what I remember from that book is, uh, is that he didn't just come up and, and sap the life out of his victim the very first time. But just weird stuff started happening, and the person would wake up and they just feel weaker today than they did yesterday. They start uh, feeling fatigued and and they go to the doctor and say, I don't know what's going wrong. Well, what happened is, Dracula was coming in night after night and just sucking a little more life. Come on. Come on. Just a little more here and a little more there. And slowly draining them until they were completely victimized. Right. An unexplained loss of energy gradually became more and more weakly and, and sickly until they were eventually completely drained of life. But wait just a minute. I'm still puffy looking at what I've observed uh, in others instead of myself. Uh, what about me? Am I that person? Am I that one uh, who was on the right track in the beginning of my walk with God but have slowly become a shell of my former self? Uh, am I the one uh, who was at 90% back then uh, but I'm much more weak and anemic in my faith today? If I am 30% less Christian today than I was back then, maybe I need to examine myself for the marks of the enemy. Amen. You know, that, that person, I don't know what's going on, uh, but I just feel weak. Uh, and there happen to be these strange marks on the side of my neck. Uh, I don't know what's going on, doctor. I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, it's the enemy sapping the strength uh, from the child of God uh, and decreasing right. your fervor. Yes, sir. It's time for us to take a close and honest look at ourselves and realize that we need a fresh infusion of the life-giving power of the blood of Jesus. We need more of Him, not less of Him. We need more dependence on God, not less. We need more church, not less. We need more of His Word, not less. We need more of His healing, not less. We need more miraculous demonstrations of His power, not less. The response of our generation to the darkness and depravity of our world must not be a ho-hum and an oh well, I guess God just doesn't work like that now, but he blesses us with the little things and he gives us the strength to endure our affliction. No, no, I'm rising today to say a thousand times no. Our response need to be what Gideon's response was to the nation of Israel's land. Look at Judges chapter 6, verse 13 with me. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of? Where are the miracles? Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now he's forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, now notice this. Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Now, I do not see a statement of faith uh, that's apparent in what Gideon said. I don't see anything that reveals that he's a mighty man. He simply said, 
Where are the miracles? I'm willing to question it. I'm willing to say that I desire something that I don't have. And God said, that's your strength. That's your might. That's how the job's going to get done is when somebody gets sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when somebody rises up and says, I'm going to do something. If I'm the only one that does it, I'm going to believe God for a change in my life. That's your might. That's where your strength's at. That's how it's going to happen. You've got to get to the place uh, that you're ready to do something about it. Uh, you've got to get to the place that you're not content with less of God. But you said, I've got to have more. His desire for the reckless and his unwillingness to accept the status quo, God said, that is your might. Right. Hebrews 13 and 8 tells us Jesus Christ, the same. I want you to say it out loud. He's the same. The same. Yesterday, Yesterday and today, today and forever. forever. Now we quote that and we preach that, but I'm not sure we have the full revelation of that scripture. When we quote that scripture, we remind ourselves that anything that God ever did, he is still able to do because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he ever opened a blinded eye, he can still do it today. If he ever unstopped a deaf ear, he can do it right now. But I want to go a giant step further with that this morning and say that not only is he still able to do what he has already done. I want you to listen closely. But he is able to do something that he has not yet done or something that I have never seen or heard of him doing before. To say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever is to say that he is still the creator God and creation is doing the things that have never been done before. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. And the Word was made flesh. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. Somebody say He's the same. Yesterday, yes. today, yes. and forever, the one who created in the beginning, the one by whom all things were made, and without him there wasn't anything made that was made, he can still reach into chaos, he can still take nothing and make something out of it. I believe in God today for some things that I haven't seen, for some things that you haven't seen. I believe in God today for a new thing. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Not only is he still doing what he's always done, but the word said he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. He is the creator, and he can still make something out of nothing. And so I arrive now at the crux of my message to you today. And that is that it is time for us to reverse the trend of slowly but surely having less and less of God. And instead it's time for us to go from 90% to 91% to 92% to 93%. Amen. It's all to do with being plugged in and being connected. Some of you came in here today and you're worried because you looked down at your phone and it said 20%. Well, you're looking around for a charger, aren't you? Well, let me tell you something this morning. When you come into the house of God, some of you need to look at your spiritual indicators. You might realize that you're on about 30%. And you might not make it much longer if you don't get yourself reconnected to Jesus Christ. He is the power source. But if you begin to connect yourself by way of faith to the one who is the master of every situation, if you begin to connect to the one that's the master of the seeds that are disturbed in your life. If you begin, if you reconnect to your power source today and begin to believe God again for some things that you've given up on and for some things that you've never even been willing to dream of or imagine, I'll tell you today, God will do a new thing. 
thing. You can be seated for a moment here. We got to begin to reconnect and go the other direction. We need more and more and more of God's power demonstrated in our lives. And this is how we do that. We must choose and determine to believe God for a new thing. We must believe that he is the exceeding abundant above all God. We must believe that the creator God will intervene for us, even in situations where we don't have a testimony of our own or anyone else's to look back on to bolster our faith. Paul showed us that this is exactly what Abraham, the father of the faithful, did. I never considered this before for some strange reason. But every time I open the word of God, I begin to see something I didn't notice before. And it said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom was sent in Isaac, shall I see be called. Verse 19, so important. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Now, have you considered that Abraham actually believed God for something that had never been done before? Yeah, you're, you're, you're doing what I did. Let me go back and check to make sure. Has anybody ever been raised? From the, we know people were raised from the dead in the Bible, don't we? But let's, let's go all the way back to Abraham. I searched the scripture. There was not one account in the word of God of anyone ever being raised from the dead until 1 Kings 17, verse 19. That was roughly a thousand years after Abraham. And then when you consider the fact that Abraham did not end up actually having to slay Isaac, when Elijah did raise the widow Zarephath's son back to life in 1 Kings 17, put that on the screen for us. He also had to believe God for something that had never been done because Abraham believed for it and then didn't need it. Because God said, don't, don't even slay your son. And then we get all the way to 1 Kings a thousand years later and the widow Zarephath's son, there's no breath left in him. Oh my God. And he said, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and he carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stressed himself upon the child three times. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. That had never happened before. He had no precedent. He couldn't say, it happened back there, Lord, you'll do it again. Right. Oh, yeah, we do that. We say, Lord, just like you parted the Red Sea, we know you'll part this sea that's before us. We know, God, uh, that because you opened the blinded eye, then you're going to heal my vision problem. Because we look back and we see what he's already done. But we forget that he is the creator. And he can do something I've never seen him do. He can do something nobody's ever seen him do. He's exceeding abundant above all. Woo, I feel this for the mark. Above all that we ask or think, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came unto him again, and he revived. I had to go back and look at these stories again because, you see, we kind of get these stories mixed up because there's another story that's eerily similar to that one. It's in the life of Elisha. Elijah, the predecessor, the first one to see the dead raised back to life in the Word of God. And then Elijah comes along and he has a, a lady that's built him a room uh, on her house for him to stay there when he comes through the area. And her son is out in the field uh, and, and laboring uh, with his father. And the son now has been grown. He was a promised child to them. And he just falls over, has some kind of a stroke or an episode and falls over. And the Bible says that this widow woman, what does she do? She carried her child to the room of the prophet Elisha and laid him on the bed. Now, how did she know to do that? How did she know? You can't tell me that when somebody is the first person to ever be raised from the dead that the whole country don't know about it. Word had gotten out. That prophet Elijah, he raised a widow woman's son back to life. He was dead. I'm telling you, he was dead. There was no breath, but his soul came back into him when the man of God prayed. And this woman, the Shunammite woman, remembered that when her son died. And she said, I remember what happened. They said that the prophet laid him on his bed and then he stressed out upon him and he revived. And so she carried him to the room and she put him on the bed of the man of God. And she went and got Elisha.
Elisha. And Elisha came back and he built upon what his predecessor had done. And he followed that pattern and he did the same thing. And he received that child raised to life again. You see, when someone was willing to believe God for a new thing, it opened up the exceeding abundance of God's power in a way that had never been experienced before. We see it in the New Testament. The woman with the issue of blood, she said in her heart, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made whole. There was nothing but faith that could tell her that because there was not one place in the Bible where it said if you'll touch the hem of his garment that you'll be made whole. There never Never been another person that had been healed in that manner, in that fashion. But she said in her heart, I believe God for a new thing. I believe God that if I can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, there's going to be a change in me. And she received her miracle. That's Matthew 9 and 20. But now look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 35 and 36. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Now how did they know to do that? Because one person said, I'm willing to believe God for a new thing. And I'm telling Greater Vision Worship Center of Puxico this morning, that if we will be willing to believe God to do the things we have not seen, something that we don't have a testimony to back up, but we say, I know he's the creator God. And there's things in my life, I, I, there's, there's situations that I, it's going on in my family that I've never heard of anybody recovering from, but I believe they're going to recover. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. I got one example in our time. I can't find any place ever that it was done except here. I talk about it, Brother Ryan talks about it. Those that were here at the very beginning, we talked about it. Sometimes I share this testimony and, and um, people look at me a little sideways, you know. Say, I don't know about that guy. But I'll tell you it happened. I don't know if it's happened since, but if somebody hears about it and they got a problem, they might, they might do it. But this is the church where there was a termite infestation. And no money to take care of it because we was poor and we was just starting out. And it took every nickel and dime we could scrape together just to get the building open up to have church. And then we found out there's termite infestation. But one of the ladies in the church began to quote the word of God. And she said, the termite is a devourer. And the Bible says that he will rebuke the devourer for our sake. And she said, I think we need to rebuke the devour. And you know what we did? We got the bottle of oil, and we began to walk around to every place that we saw uh, termite uh, tracks on the walls, and we began to anoint the walls, the whole church, all eight or ten or twelve of us at the time. We began to anoint the walls, and we began to rebuke the devour. We began to pray for God to heal our building. Yeah. And the next morning, Pastor Ron, our assistant pastor for 10 years. He came in the next morning and he beat me to the house of God. When I come into my office, he was already in there and he met me at the door and he said, son, come in here. I got to show you something. He said, you're not going to believe this. And I walked in and the whole floor was covered with dead termites. There were hundreds if not thousands of dead termites laying on the floor. Amen. Because somebody said, let's believe God for a new thing. When it's been done before, I know he's able to do it now. And I'm going to believe him. Would you stand with me right now? I think we need to have a prayer line today. Yes. Hallelujah. Brother Pulliam, come here and get this oil. Hallelujah. Brother Mark, Brother Reagan, Brother Owen, I want you to come up here in faith right now. We're going to lay hands on people who have needs today. And I'm going to tell you some things. I'm going to confess before God some things that God's convicted me over. Are you, are you listening? 